Hi friends, thank you for joining us again for the ASP Stories weekend bonus episode. Join us on Mondays and Thursdays where we interview amazing guests where they share with us about their adventure sports and the amazing feats that they have done. But ASP Stories is where we get to listen in as authors read their adventure stories to us. So sit back with your hot cup of tea or coffee and kick off your adventure-filled weekend by listening in while we hear more from ASP Stories. We've come to our final reading from Sam Manicom. This will be Chapter 15, From Tortillas to Totems. If you want to check out more information about Sam, you can visit his website at sam-manicom.com, and you can also hear his interview on Episode 149. Now, on to Tortillas to Totems. Chapter 15. Indian Summer. Oscar Maria Graf wrote... A person should only travel if he is willing to be surprised completely. It's an Indian summer. Some years we're lucky, the locals told us. June weather in September. To the north, Alaska was wintry. But here in the Okanagan Valley, we were the warmest we'd been since Mexico. It seemed as if we were being rewarded for having the sense to say no to going on northwards. The temptation was to slow down a little and really explore but we had a bee in our helmets. Just a few hundred kilometres to the west lay the normally grey and wet Vancouver Island. This rare gift of perfect biking weather had to be a good time to explore the largest island on the west coast of North America. As we pushed onto the coast, two options faced us. Either the busy Route 5 and then the one to the city of Vancouver, which is on the mainland, along with everyone else who had to be there yesterday. Or we could slip down towards the border with the USA and twist and turn our way along Route 3 with its provincial parks. No contest, and there were stacks more opportunities to camp along the three. A British Columbia ferry took us across the Strait of Georgia from Powell River to Vancouver Island, which is huge. 460 kilometres from one end to the other and over 30,000 square kilometres in area. It's roughly the same size as Taiwan. The sun stayed with us for the 80-minute crossing. The sea was flat calm, and the horizon a misty blue against blue. Sleek cormorants fished from the rocks of small, vividly green islands, and the ferry's wake gently rocked passing fishing boats as we cruised across the water. In Alaska, the weather had taken a severe turn for the worse. Snowstorms were now a daily event. The ferry landed at Comox. This small town calls itself the village by the sea, and it does have a village-like atmosphere. People say hello to each other when they pass on the street, and shopkeepers seem to know many of their customers by name. One of the things that had really impressed me with our brief stay in the city of Vancouver, which I liked as far as cities go, was the collection of totem poles down on the waterfront in Stanley Park. I'd heard about totem poles, and of course I'd seen them in the movies, but I'd never seen one in real life. These ones impressed me, and they seemed to fill a blank in our journey through Canada. We'd not seen or heard much about the original occupants of the land. That was almost certainly due to our desire to keep riding, but doing that had left a gap. I'd read that Vancouver Island was home to many more totems, and I was keen to see them. I really liked the way that they stood so tall and proud. Some of the carvings are almost arrogant as they stare down directly at you, or even straight over the top of your head, as if you don't exist at all. The town of Campbell River sits on the coast just to the north of Comox. It's on the side of a vast bay that's backdropped by snow-topped mountains and edged by fjords. With the sun out, the greens and blues of the land and sea were in perfect harmony. With these colours around us, the colours and angular shapes on the totem poles in and around the town stood out with a sharp vibrancy that reminded me of the colours and designs the Aztecs used. That thought made me think about just how far we'd come over the months in Mexico, the USA and Canada. It was a happy feeling, and even now, whenever I see a picture of a totem, I still have a little buzz from the happiness of that moment. Totem poles are usually carved out of western red cedar, and the tallest totem 
is claimed to be 52.7 metres high. It's thought that in the past, totems were not objects of worship, as the first Christian settlers had believed, but more used to proclaim the status of a powerful member of a tribe or clan. Even now, it takes around 6 to 12 months for a skilled carver to make one. The eagles, people, frogs and other creatures that are depicted on totem poles are thought to recount legends and remarkable events, and also can describe a clan's lineage. At one time, the people represented on a totem were thought to be placed in the order of rank. The more powerful you were, the higher up the pole you were placed. The reality, however, is different. It doesn't matter where the most powerful person is on the totem. Each culture has its own, sometimes complex, rules regarding the carved designs. They are always stylized, and some were carved with the aim of publicly ridiculing a person or clan that had done wrong, and deserved some stick. That concept tickled me. I could think of a border official or two I'd like to carve on a totem pole. The more totems I saw, the more I liked them. The Port Alberni Road to the west coast of the island is a gem. It's another of Canada's where-do-I-look roads. But this was the best yet. It felt like riding a dream. This time, I concentrated on riding the road. The view of the snow-capped mountains could wait for the return journey. Windswept, fog-bound and wet. That was the West Coast's grim reputation, but for us, the sun shone. The moss on the trees and the rainforest ceased to drip, and the lakes looked like mirrors. Birgit and I cruised on, catching glimpses of sandy, log-strewn coves and rolling white horses in the surf until we hit the end of the road. The town of Tofino proudly proclaims that it's the furthest west that you can drive in Canada. Of course, we had to stop and pose under that sign. In the background, small float planes lifted off from the flat calm of the bay. The planes are a common sight in these parts. For many people, they're the only alternative to several days of overland or sea travel just to get to the nearest town. Just to the north of Tofino is one of the most extraordinary phenomena in the world, a coastal temperate rainforest. Such forests exist in only a handful of other places, including the South Island of New Zealand and southern Chile. Birgit and I had ridden through the forest on our way up through the gravel tracks of the Carretera Austral, but also the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State, and here on the west coast of Vancouver Island. This type of forest is much rarer than tropical rainforest, covering only a fraction of 1% of the Earth's land mass. Amazingly, they hold twice as much organic material per acre as tropical rainforests. We'd been lucky enough to do a little hiking on the Olympic Peninsula on the way north, and there we'd been astounded by the forest. It was as if we had stepped into an ancient fairy tale world. Lush green mosses carpeted the ground in rolling soft green waves. Mist filled the air, competing with and enhancing the musty sense of age. Feathery ferns collected in clumps in the shadier, damper recesses of gently decaying fallen logs. Giant trees drooped with dripping, straggly grey tree moss. The moss reflected the pale yellow sunlight through each drop of moisture, so that the world looked as if we were seeing it through a section of a kaleidoscope. All the sounds around us were deadened by the moisture-filled air. The breeze in the treetops, the calls of the birds and the tumbling water in the nearby stream. The majestic calm and the fluttering, magical beams of light that worked their ways through the treetops made me want to hold my breath as if just the sound of my breathing could break a spell. We'd stood absolutely stock still, until I could hold my breath no longer. But I'd not broken the spell at all. Around us, the fairy tale world had continued to work its magic, and we'd hiked on, enthralled by the majestic trees and the lush, rumpled green land. Now, though, I was really happy not to be actually in the rainforest, and I was equally happy that it wasn't raining. That night, we didn't have to hunt hard to find a spot to camp. We just rode until we'd had enough and then picked one of the many wooded riverbanks to put the tent up on. The bikes were brilliant for this. 
In an ordinary car, you didn't have a chance, but 4x4s and bikes could always get to deserted and beautiful spots. This spot was right on the snow line. Just a few metres to one side of the tent, the ground was covered in a light dusting of snow, which deepened into snowdrifts as the hillside climbed. In spite of the sunshine, the river was icy cold from the snow runoff. I couldn't believe it when Birgit said that she was going to take a bath. But bathe she did, and then made pointed remarks about the state of feet that had sat under hot cylinders all day. Shamed into it, I dunked too. I'll try most things once, and I have to admit, the air inside the tent was sweeter that night. The morning sunshine allowed us a treat. We'd camped up in the mountainous backbone that runs along much of the length of Vancouver Island. These mountains are veined with a series of streams and logging tracks. There's a sad but typical story about them. Over the last two centuries, more than three quarters of Vancouver Island's very ancient forest has been cut down. Now, in an attempt to save some of the old growth, a biosphere reserve has been set up, but many of the other forests are still fair game. In fact, an enormous part of the island has now been replanted with a mix of faster-growing timber for controlled logging, but also some of the original red cedars. Most of these gravel tracks are privately owned and at weekends they're open to the public. During the week, some of the tracks can still be used, but with extreme caution. The forests are still actively logged and the giant thundering logging trucks stop for no one. Their drivers are paid by the load, so they really shift. We weren't worried, though. The bikes were easy to get out of the way, and even with helmets on, we could hear the trucks well before they got to us. We listened hard and rode hard. It's playtime out there. Loose gravel, sand, steep hills, single-lane wooden bridges, and the ever-present threat of a darting wild animal made the tracks an even more challenging ride. Covered in dust, we sped on through the forests, stopping only for photos and food. There were hardly any road signs and lots of tracks, so we managed to get lost quite a few times. No worries. We had no time limits, plenty to eat, water wasn't a problem, and the bikes were running well. We pretty much grinned our way back down to the coast. There was just one tumble, which caused only a bent pannier and a broken mirror. There was a red face too, though. The tumble had been one of those situations when everything happens to work against you at just the wrong moment. The gravelly roads often narrowed down to a single track when there was a bridge over a river or a creek. The rule of the road is simple. If it's bigger than you, then you let it go first. That's fine, but this time everything about the bridge was a problem. The road on our side swooped down steeply to it, and the surface was loosely scattered with pea and walnut-sized gravel. The bikes skipped down the gravel slope quite comfortably, but we both braked cautiously when we got close to the bridge. The loose stuff on its wooden boards would be the next challenge. Immediately after the bridge was a steep climb for about 30 metres. It was followed by a sharp turn to the left. This meant that as we were lining up to take the bridge, we didn't see the pickup truck that came hurtling around the corner until the last minute. The driver obviously hadn't expected to see anyone there, and he almost broadsided his truck in his attempt to stop before hitting us. Birgit already had her throttle wide open with the aim of rushing up the gravelly hill on the other side. Her momentum carried her halfway up the other side to within a few metres of the pickup before she managed to stop. That was one of the worst situations for her. The back brake on her bike wasn't good enough to hold the bike on a steep slope. She needed to use the front brake too, but the bike still slid backwards on the gravel. The sheer weight of the bike conspired with gravity and the loose surface to overcome its brakes. She'd stall the bike and it was in third gear. She couldn't get the bike back into first gear and to start again, before the slow ride changed into a sickeningly fast rush back down towards the bridge and the deep gully it spanned. She had no choice. Much to the bemusement of the guys in the pickup truck, she jumped off and let the bike fall to its side. I suddenly found myself battling with the slide too. I hung on tightly, trying to keep upright, while trying to change down from third to first. 
the bike would have stalled if I'd tried to pull to safety in third. I got into the lowest gear at the last possible moment, and with a spray of gravel, I belted past Birgit and the pickup to the top of the slope. Parking up hurriedly, I ran back down towards Birgit. The men were still sitting inside their pickup. With a flash of worried anger, I rather cynically wondered if they thought that we were just putting on a show for their entertainment. They had front row seats after all. I shouted to them to give a hand as I ran past them to Birgit, who was already trying to pick the bike up. A hopeless task, as every time she almost got the bike onto its wheels, the thing slipped over on the loose gravel. To give the guys credit, they both jumped out and within seconds, we had Sir Henry upright again. With not a word, Birgit climbed on board, fired him up, clicked into first gear, and with much spraying of gravel, made it to the top. The guys were looking at me with question marks all over their faces. As Birgit walked back down to thank them for their help, I explained what had gone wrong. They were full of apologies. We were going too fast, I guess, the driver said. Where are you heading for? We explained that we were looking for a place to camp, and they gave us directions to a great spot by the river, just ten kilometres further along. A little shaken by our narrow escape, we took their advice and called it an early day. About three hours later, when we'd already curled up inside the tent, we heard the sound of a vehicle crunching up the gravel to our spot. The powerful engine was switched off, and then there was a rather sinister silence. It could have been anyone. Through the fabric of the tent, we could feel eyes on us. It stayed silent outside. No footsteps, no banging doors, nothing. I had to look. If this was trouble, then we'd be better off dealing with it face on. No worries, it was just the guys from the truck. They'd been wondering if we were in the tent or had gone for a walk. When they'd not been able to see us, they'd settled down to wait. They'd been fishing and had bought us a large salmon as a sort of apology, not that one was needed, of course, but a nice gesture. For once, the weather forecast was right and the Indian summer finished as predicted, but it ended with a vengeance. Unwilling to pay the campsite prices in Victoria, which is Vancouver Island's capital, we wild camped again. That night, the delayed winter fought back, and we realised we should have spent the money on the campsite. We set up camp in the last rays of the sun. A gentle breeze was floating in from the sea. The view from our west-facing ridge was well worth the steep rocky climb that even the bikes had made hard work of. As usual, we slipped into our sleeping bags when the sun finally disappeared. That was one of the things that I really liked about being on the road. Mostly we lived by the sun, early to bed and early to rise. If there was a sunset, we saw it, and the peace and light of early mornings always made a gentle start to a day. But this time, if only we'd known what was going to happen next, we'd have really made the most of the sunset. The threatened weather change didn't just roll in gently. It arrived like an avenging banshee. A windstorm belted in from the Pacific with enough force to rip branches from the trees. Fortunately, our tent had loads of guy lines. The months of putting them all out, just in case, paid off. Even so, the force eight gales pushed and shoved us around so much that by morning we felt as if we could have almost flown off the island by three-berth tent-turned-hanglider rather than by ferry. Indian summer, that last stormy night brought our time in Canada to an emphatic close, like an exclamation mark from the weather gods. We'd lost the dream of getting right up into Alaska, but we'd lived another. We'd ridden wonderfully on borrowed time, and the bikes had done everything we'd asked of them. Now it was time to move on. We would soon be exchanging kilometres for miles in the USA, but first, Canada had one little going-away present to surprise us with. While in Victoria, we'd hunted out Island BMW. It was a long time since we'd been to a BMW dealership. The staff treated us with friendly warmth, and we natted with them as we wandered around fingering top-quality gear of the like we'd probably never be able to afford. I asked one of the salesmen what the Alaska attempt would have been like if we'd had really good gear instead of our ragtag collection of worn-out kit and thrift shop purchases. The salesman pointed to a bit of clothing and said, 
You guys should have a couple of these. The difference they make is significant. I looked at what seemed to be a thin fabric waistcoat and wondered what on earth he was talking about. My kit was better than this. He saw the confusion on my face and said, It's a heated waistcoat. You plug it into the battery on your bike. They're great. We'd never heard of such a thing. But the more I thought about it, the more they seemed like a wonderful idea. Wow, if we'd only had these on the run up the Cassia Highway. The heated waistcoats were well over $100 each, and that put them right out of our price range, however much we drooled over them. $100 was a week's living for us, and we were running out of living money. We still had to make it all the way across the USA, and then have enough money to pay for getting ourselves and the bikes back to the UK. And I'd promised myself that I wasn't going to arrive back in the UK skint. I couldn't think of anything worse than arriving back from a trip like ours with no money left at all. We had family and friends to see, and we'd have new lives to build. These lives would have to be built as if we had just come out of college. We'd be starting from scratch. But the temptation to break into the money we'd set aside and to splash out on a couple of waistcoats was really strong. I resisted, and Berger agreed. We'd done OK so far, we'd just keep going as we were. But a little voice in my mind said that perhaps this was the wrong decision. Inside the waistcoat was the manufacturer's label, and to my surprise, it was a Vancouver Island address. We explained our predicament to the salesman, who very kindly let us take a look at his telephone book. The company was listed. I'd have a talk with them and see if we could do something on the price. Do you suffer from acute lethargy, stiff joints, weight management challenges, and worsening eyesight or hearing issues? Do you sometimes feel low in energy or have trouble sleeping well? Do you wonder at times about your path in life and your vitality? You may be suffering from PYAD. This disorder is much more common than you might at first think. The good news is that we have a remedy that can alleviate many of these undesired symptoms. This life-altering remedy for PYAD is called ASP and can help you get your life back again. Regain your energy and excitement for life. Sleep better at night. Watch unwanted pounds drop off as muscle mass recovers. Many using ASP report a new vitality and even report improvements in their social life. ASP may be the remedy you are looking for. Recent studies have shown that individuals not suffering from PYAD, post-youth aging disorder, also experience great benefits from ASP. Matter of fact, people of all ages from all backgrounds report amazing improvements by using ASP to enrich and recover their zest for living. Sound too good to be true? It is not. ASP, the Adventure Sports Podcast, can help you get the enthusiasm, strength, and fun back in your life. The aforementioned claims have not been medically verified and no animals were harmed in the making of this advertisement. Hey guys, if you want to help support the Adventure Sports Podcast, do us a favor and visit our site at adventuresportspodcast.com and click on the sponsor links on the right-hand side of the page. Even if you're not in the market for one of their products right now, it's always good for them to know that you're hearing about them on our show. If you'd like to support us directly, you can visit our site at www.180tack. There you'll find the 180 stove and 180 flame camp stoves, as well as the Bearline Plus utility system. Consider picking one up for yourself or maybe even for your fellow adventurer. And last but not least, you can always visit patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast and donate a little bit to the show. Thanks for being awesome listeners. We truly value you guys. And now back to the show. Back in the city, we made the call. To our amazement, the owners of the New Age Motorcycle Accessories Company said, no, we can't give you a discount, even exchange for mention in one of your magazine articles, but we do have seconds. We could probably let you guys have some for around $20 each. You'd have to come here for them, though. The waistcoats did cost just $20. Their only blemish was a bit of dodgy stitching. That didn't matter at all to us and we rode away in heated bliss. The ferry from Victoria dropped us off in the town of Anacortes on Fidalgo Island. We were just 20 minutes ride away from the home of Dave and Sue, the biker friends of Pete and Peggy that we'd met on the way north. 
They'd invited us to stay with them if we ever came back their way, so we took them up on that offer. They had an old camper van in their backyard that was parked next to Dave's motorcycle workshop and Sue's leather workshop. You guys can stay as long as you like. And hey, Christmas isn't far off. Why don't you at least stay until then? This was too good an opportunity to miss, and it would give us the chance to think about what to do next. Winter was here. We had a couple of choices. We could carry on with the ride and try to make it across the northern states to New York. We could do that fairly easily in a month, but it would be a hard, cold month, and we'd be spending most of our time concentrating on putting miles under our wheels and surviving. Neither of us fancied that idea much. Or we could hole up for a while, do odd jobs in exchange for food and places to stay, and wait out the worst of the winter. In the spring, we could set off again. If we headed south, we'd ride out of the bad weather, and would be able to ride across the states in the warm. That idea appealed. We sat down to talk things through with Dave, Sue, Peter, and Peggy. Dave and Sue reiterated their invitation for us to stay as long as we liked, and if we wanted to do odd jobs to pay our way, well, that was fine with them. There was plenty to do. Peter and Peggy said that they had a few jobs that they could think of straight away, and that in any event, if we wanted to hole up with them for a while, then we'd be very welcome to do so. The decision was made. We'd stay in Anacortes for a couple of months. I'd once hitchhiked around Europe for a year, and I'd kept myself fed and on the move by doing odd jobs for people. There's always a lawn that needs mowing, a hedge that needs cutting, windows to wash, a vegetable patch to dig over, or a car to wash. It had worked then, and I'd managed to get under the skin of each country I'd travelled through by spending real time with people. I'd met some amazing characters too. One of the guys I'd worked with was a professional sewer digger in Greece. He had a tremendous pride, and everything had to be done just right. The ditches for the pipes had to be exactly the right depth, with the correct gradient, whatever the terrain. The walls of the ditches had to be straight, and the earth had to be cleared of rocks before it was put back into the ditches after the pipes had been laid. All of the work was done by hand, with shovels, under a blazing Greek sun. But he was a man who was happy with life. He laughed a lot, and that meant that the work was never a chore. Birgit wanted to find out more about pouring concrete floors, and she was intrigued by what Sue managed to conjure out of leather. The bonus for me was that the camper van to live in meant that I could get on with writing articles, and that would bring some money in. If we were going to get another six months in the states, then we'd have to earn some hard cash. The weeks passed rapidly, and preparations for Christmas were well underway locally. We'd not seen anything like it before. Most of the houses in and around the town are wooden framed and wood clad. We liked this style, and when you have so much timber on your doorstep, it seemed like the right material to be building with. So long as its harvesting was properly managed and sustainably done, but soon most of the houses were almost unrecognisable, because they were festooned with Christmas lights. The electricity grid must have been working overtime to cope with them all. At night, Anacortes was like something out of a Christmas fairy tale. Reds, blues, yellows, and greens shone out into the dark. Ice lights tumbled in electronic, twinkling white and blue waterfalls from people's gables. Santa and his reindeer walked across many lawns, and Santa was often found climbing up the sides of houses like some sort of illuminated burglar. Glowing plastic snowmen sat on lawns, and shining green elves clustered around walkways. Their cartoon character faces flushed with rosy-cheeked Christmas cheer. A happy, anticipatory mood settled over the town, and shop windows displayed a vast array of goodies. The local motorcycle club did their Christmas charity run through the town, and I suspect that just about every resident was there, muffled up in thick coats, to watch them cruise through. It was a time of unity, and if there had ever been any bad feeling between the town's residents, it didn't show. The mood was one of love thy neighbour. A guy walked over to us and said, "You two are the travellers, aren't you?" He was a short man with a bulging waist. Between the open front of his jacket, we could see that he had a shirt with two buttons missing, and that at some time he'd collected a food stain down it. 
His shoes were battered, and his trousers didn't look as if they'd seen an iron since they were bought. I was a little suspicious of him, but had thought to myself, well, he's not going to be too much trouble, if he looks like this. Then he said, I like to get the chance to talk to unusual people. As we talked, we had no idea who he was, but Dave put us right at the end of the day. The guy was the local millionaire. He ran a large construction company and had an unusual hobby. He collected military vehicles. Bill has a warehouse full of tanks, jeeps, a half-track, and he's just bought a MiG fighter jet. He's taking lessons so he can learn how to fly the thing. Books and covers. One of the jobs that Peter and Peggy had for us was to put up a plasterboard, or sheet rock as they called it, lining in Peter's workshop. Before we started, it was so cold you could see your breath in there. The first thing to do was to slot into place thick sheets of pink polystyrene insulation. That was the easy bit, and it instantly made a difference. The next job was easy too. We lined the walls with sheetrock. That gave a nice neat finish and some additional warmth as well. But because the flat was above the workshop, all the insulation had to be covered with a double layer of much thicker sheetrock, and this wasn't so easy. Normally, a small scaffold tower would have been the thing to use, but Peter didn't have one, so Birgit and I wobbled around on the top of stepladders. Soon, our arms and necks began to ache from the effort of holding the sheets while we fixed them in place with nails. We must have looked quite amateurish, but at least we were getting the job done. Peter wasn't too impressed by my wimpy efforts to get the four-inch nails through the two layers of sheet rock and into the timber above. He commented dryly, in America, a builder isn't a builder unless he can get nails like that knocked in with two hits. A good guy will do it in one. I know a guy who can do one with his fist. It was taking me four or five with a hammer. That was also the day that Peter told us that he could kickstart his Harley by hand, and that was impressive. It took both Birgit and me two or three jumps on Sir Henry's kickstart to get him going. Peter gave me his orange, waterproof, heavy-duty Alaskan fisherman's trousers. At one time, he'd worked the fishing boats up north. Though he wouldn't talk about it much, we understood the work to be harsh, dangerous and gruelling. But when the catches were good, it was well paid. He didn't give me the trousers to wear on the bike, though. He had no further need of them, and we needed to make some other protective gear. One of the things that we'd seen at the Christmas motorcycle run was a couple of bikes with muffs over the hand grips on their handlebars. This had seemed to be a great idea. Not only would they help to keep our hands dry, but they would keep most of the wind off them too. We had to have some. I also thought that the bright orange colour would help keep me noticed in bad weather. Birgit used the equipment in Sue's leather workshop to stitch a set together for me. She also made a set for herself out of some redundant bright yellow waterproofs, which we'd found in a thrift shop. At this time, we didn't even know about the existence of heated handlebar grips, despite the fact that they'd been around for many years, as I discovered later. Sue kindly stitched me a replacement saddle cover out of thick black cowhide. The old one had disintegrated from the years of hard use, and where the vinyl had split, the foam underneath was a sponge for all the rain we'd been having. Once the vinyl had split, my sheepskin saddle pads had also become saturated with water. This meant that I was always riding on a cold, soggy surface, which wasn't exactly an aid to keeping warm. The first month of the new year came and went, and we decided that we should move on before we outstayed our welcome. We'd also given Dave a few surprises. I still had to do an hour of physio exercises for my back every morning, and some of them were quite active. One morning, Dave came out into the backyard with Jessica. He was taking her off to school. I'd been making the camper van rock suspiciously, and as I was doing so, I heard Jessica say to Dave, Why is the camper van rocking like that, Dad? Dave, thinking that uh, Birgit and I were getting close inside, muttered something that we couldn't quite hear, but when he got back, he couldn't resist a bit of leg pulling. Embarrassed, I tried to explain. Dave's expression was one of methinks he doth protest too much, which he combined with a broad man-to-man -man grin. We left Anacortes with a plan. 
we'd head south to the Chenard Winery again, trying to take as different a route as possible. It would be a real bonus to see everyone there, and Birgit was bubbling with the anticipation of being there during a different stage of the winemaking process. She'd become absolutely enthralled with winemaking, and I, of course, was quite happy to try some more of the vineyard's produce. It would also give me the chance to get some spring planting done in the gardens. The weather the day we left Anacortes wasn't too bad, but it started raining again as soon as we hit the highway south. Thanks to our new heated waistcoats, the chilly rain was unpleasant but not unbearable. In fact, it was far warmer to keep riding with the waistcoats plugged in than to walk around on our leg stretches or sightseeing. I did wonder whether all the water that was sneaking down my neck was going to blow a fuse or frazzle me, but happily it didn't. We carried on with our odd job hunting and, as always, were happily surprised when someone gave us work. Then I had an offer that I couldn't refuse. It was an irresistible combination of the chance to help someone out of a hole and to earn some hard cash. We'd stopped off at a cafe where a bike club had pulled up for a break on a ride out and were wandering around looking at the bikes and nattering to people. Whenever we found someone who looked and sounded sympathetic, we asked the question. We are looking for any odd jobs you might have for us. We are happy with a meal and somewhere to stay in payments, though a bit of pocket money, if we do a good enough job, would be very welcome. Have you got anything for us to do? We weren't being very successful at it, but perseverance was the name of the game. Then a man from the crowd stopped us, and the next thing I knew, he was saying, I have a small business and a job that needs doing, but I can't find anyone to do it. It's three weeks' work. Can you drive? Too right I can, I replied. What's the work? At this stage, I didn't like to tell him that I'd not driven anything with four wheels for about ten years. You come and see me tomorrow morning. We start at 7am. Here's the address. With that, he turned and disappeared into the crowd. The next morning, I arrived at the address to find that it was the yard for a construction company. It was bustling with life. Pickup trucks were coming and going. A digger was moving hardcore in one of the corners, and another was loading sand into the back of a big green Mack dumper truck. There were seven of these enormous trucks in the yard, and behind where they were neatly parked in a row were a steamroller and a battered yellow bulldozer. On one side of the potholed yard was a set of porter cabin offices. I parked the bike in the most out of the way corner I could find and walked past all the muddy 4x4s and cars outside the office. The ice edged potholes were filled with muddy water. Around the yard, the leafless trees dripped with freezing rain that had set in for the day. Before I could knock, a large man in work clothes came bustling out of the office. He saw me. Nodded his yellow hard hat in my direction and said, I'm the foreman. You must be the new guy. This is your truck over here. Thankfully, he pointed at one of the pickups and not at one of the Max, most of which were now sending black smoke into the sky from their roof mounted exhaust pipes. You take this truck full of gear and follow that pickup over there. The driver's name is Bobby. With that, he spun on his heel and headed out of the yard shouting, You goddamn fool! Mind those bricks! They'll come out of your pay packet if you hit them. I couldn't see who he was shouting at, but decided that I'd try my best not to get on the wrong side of the foreman. My problem started at the pickup. Bobby was sitting inside the cab of his truck and looking at me expectantly and impatiently. The keys were in the truck, but oh gloom. It was an automatic. I had no idea how to drive one. I'd only ever driven a car or a van with manual gear change. I sat inside looking at it, trying to work out how to make the truck work. Bobby, meantime, was getting edgy, but when I went over to explain what the problem was, he cracked up laughing. I knew that this was a story he'd be telling in the bar that night. Driving an automatic with a doddle, and I drove hard, trying to keep up with Bobby, who must have been a rally driver in his free time. At this stage, I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing, and I had no idea how much I was going to be paid. Bobby shot off up a side turn onto a dirt road. He splashed his truck through the muddy potholes as if his one aim in life was to trash the suspension on it, or at least to change its colour from green to brown. Suddenly, we arrived at a building site. 
The guys were building the roads and making a drainage reservoir for an estate of houses. The back of my truck was full of iron rods and shovels. I still had no idea what I was supposed to do. You park up over there, Bobby yelled. I'll get the keys for your truck. Don't worry, it's not an automatic. He grinned as he said that. Um, keys to my truck? Wonder what he's talking about. I climbed out of my cab to watch what was going on. On the edge of a large hole, perhaps 200 yards across, was a bright yellow digger. It was scooping out buckets full of earth from the bottom of the hole, swinging the bucket round and dumping the earth in the back of one of the big Mack trucks. This truck, when full, hurtled off to the other side of the plot and dumped its load to join the fast-growing pile. This pile was about three-quarters of a mile away from the hole. While he was doing that, another truck had taken its place and two more trucks were working within the load-and-dump loop. The pace was frantic, but very efficiently done. The digger operator judged every scoop perfectly and every turn he did was done with such fluidity that I could see instantly that he was highly skilled. The trucks were bouncing back and forth across the rutted field, their giant tyres hitting the ruts and making the trucks leap as they went, especially when they were empty. Suddenly, Bobby was back with me. That's your truck, he pointed across at a Mac that had been sitting idle by the edge of the field. Fire up and get her in the loop. Driven one before? You haven't? Oh, shoot. Come with me. With that, he strode briskly off towards the truck, which had by this time taken on an air of evil malevolence. You got lots of gears, but you only need first through third for this job. You change them like this. He operated a hand paddle and a shifted a gear. You pull this lever to dump your load. And with that, he was gone. I sat looking at the scene before me, thinking, I can't do this. I'll hit something. And reverse? Where's the gear for that? How do you reverse a monster like this anyway? I hadn't been confronted with anything as scary as this to do for years. Give me a South American border crossing any day. I hit the ignition button and gently pressed the accelerator. The giant dumper truck roared at me, and I swear I'd already turned some heads on the site. Then it lurched forward in a series of kangaroo hops. Very embarrassing. Bloody scary, too. I set off with the truck heaving itself over the ruts and bumps. I didn't feel in control at all. Somehow I got it in to join the queue. I drove forward, trying to line it up so that I could reverse back under the digger's bucket. My turn. I put the truck into reverse. The only thing I could see was the digger bucket in the air, waiting for me to get there. Blast, I've lined it up wrong. The digger driver took pity on me and swung his digger towards me with such skill that he might have been spinning a coin. With an angry blast on his horn, he started to load my truck. With a double toot on his horn, I was full, and the tone was, Get the hell out of here! I plonked the truck into first gear, praying that I wasn't going to stall. I was being too slow. Two other trucks were waiting. That hadn't happened while I'd been watching. I got the truck into second gear and we bounced across the ruts and then into third just in time to get to the dump site. I swung the truck around as best I could, backed it up a little and pulled the lever. The truck instantly felt lighter. First gear, off round the loop. There was no one under the digger's bucket. I was being too slow. I was causing a jam. I hurriedly lined up again and backed up, praying that I was better lined up this time, and not, heaven forbid, going to drive the truck into the hole. I'd stuffed it up again. The digger driver gave me three head-turning angry blasts this time. Then the load was full, and off I went across the field, driving crazily fast in second gear, almost flattening the humps as I went. I swung the truck around, angry now, I dumped my load and made it back to the digger. This went on for hours, but even with practice, I was still holding everything up, and my reversing skills didn't improve much, but I was beginning to enjoy myself. The key was to ignore everyone else and to concentrate on what I was doing. But I started to have a new problem. 
The driver's seat in the Mac was well sprung, but in spite of that, the jolting across the rutted field when the truck was empty was miserable. Before too long, my slipped discs started to complain. By the middle of the afternoon, I was in trouble, but I stuck at it. It was a pride thing, and stupid really, but I also didn't want to let anyone down. And of course, I'd been living out that childhood dream of driving a truck like this. But the dream hadn't included this sort of driving. I almost fell out of the truck at the end of the day, but honour was kept. Even so, I'd made a decision. I wouldn't be able to cope with another day like that. I'd have to explain. I hunted out the boss back at the porter cabin offices. I'm really sorry I started. I've got to tell you that I can't do this work. I'll only be letting you and the other guys down. I went on to explain the situation to the boss, who, to his credit, listened hard. Don't worry, I've got other stuff for you to do. How did you get on with the pickup? He'd already heard the automatic story. Can you drive a steamroller? Well, I've never tried before, but I'm quick to learn, I replied, with fingers crossed that he was sensible enough not to give me a job that my bones couldn't deal with. I spent the next three weeks driving the steamroller, delivering equipment to the company's various sites, and driving round to other companies with drawings and settling invoices. I was also tasked with hand finishing ditches for laying drainage and utility pipes. My back didn't mind this work at all. And of course, I'd had some experience of the job from my time in Greece, though this time the gradients were worked out with lasers and not just by eye. The three weeks of work earned enough money for us to travel on for nearly three more months. But the bonuses were all of the things that I'd learnt, which I probably never would have come across in real life back home. It also gave me a chance to learn about this way of life. It's hard to make a living in winter doing this sort of work. You never stop for the weather, and even snow didn't hold things up for very long. Time was money, and everything was done at top speed. I couldn't help but be impressed by the work ethic of the crew. I didn't see one single person turn up late. All the guys arrived, got their orders, which always seemed to be well thought out, headed for the site, and got stuck straight into the work. I was really surprised that there wasn't a guy who played the part of the fool. I'd never worked within a team of people where there wasn't a full set of characters, with apparently preordained roles to play. There always seemed to be a serious one, a muscle man, and a slightly thick guy who was unceasingly willing and would turn his hand to everything and anything that was asked of him. I'd worked in a couple of crews where this guy was often the butt of the jokes, but not on this team. He was accepted for his enthusiasm and not criticised for the fact that he was a little slow on the uptake. There would always be a scholar, and there'd be the guy who was a slacker. The final standout character was the grump. This team had its scholar, and the guy was vastly knowledgeable about the building industry, but seemed to back away from any form of responsibility. He liked what he was doing, and he seemed to like being one of the boys. No one slacked, and no one stood out as the grump. Interesting. Most of the crews also had a wide boy or spiv. This guy would always be looking out for a way to make a fast buck, and if the rules had to be bent to achieve that, well, so long as no one was looking. And one of the other key members I always seemed to find was the Joker in the pack. There'd always be something funny going on around the guy who played the fool. Sometimes the jokes would be a bit close to the mark, but whenever stress relief was needed, this guy would always pop up with something that would crack everyone up. But such a character was strangely missing from this crew. In spite of that, the work atmosphere was good-humoured. The team as a whole got on really well together, and actually, everyone wisecracked. The respect between them was obvious. And I couldn't help but be impressed at how focused they were, and how they always wanted to finish the job before going home. I wondered if the way this team was was down to good management, luck, or the way that Americans were when they're in an environment such as this. Those three weeks gave me a perspective on a part of American life that I would not have got any other way.
All right, thanks for listening to Sam Manicom's reading of Tortillas to Totems. That'll do it for Sam's books. You can check him out at sam-manicom.com and listen to his interview on episode 149 of the Adventure Sports Podcast. Next week, we'll be moving on to Elspeth Baird's book called Lone Rider. Elspeth was the first woman to ride around the world on a motorcycle. Until then, get out and have some fun. 